Hi, I'm Linda Eads. This is an update on the ReCM Global Flexible Fund, looking specifically at the third quarter of this year, talking to the returns of the fund, the contributors, detractors to returns, and then of course looking at how the fund is positioned overall and what that means for investors going forward. So if we look at the quarter, the fund was actually slightly up during the third quarter to return 0.4% after fees. And that was against quite a negative backdrop locally. So you'll probably know that the JSC All Share Index was actually down more than 4% during the third quarter. But it does kind of give a sort of similar um, experience to what you would have at the global equity market level. So for instance, the MSCI All Countries World Index was actually flat during the third quarter. And that uh, doesn't really reflect the fact that there was quite a bit of disparity amongst developed markets and emerging markets such as South Africa. So the developed markets were actually up slightly and that was really because central banks are cutting interest rates. They've done an about turn and they're starting to sort of um, get a bit concerned about stimulating the economy, um, which actually should raise some concerns about where the US equities should be rallying with that backdrop. But nonetheless, the US equity markets continue to take that as a sign that the party continues for the moment. And then on the emerging market side, trade tensions between the US and China actually had quite a negative impact on most emerging markets and most emerging market currencies. So the RAND was also under pressure during the quarter, but this isn't a local phenomenon. I think often we get sort of bogged down in our local politics and our local narrative, but in actual fact, most emerging markets came under pressure. Fortunately, it does seem that the RAND has rebounded quite a bit since the end of the quarter, uh, so that will be a positive. But overall, having global exposure in the fund was actually a positive um, for the Global Flexible Fund um, and resulted in that flat return. So currently, about 60% of the fund is actually non-RAND exposure, so offshore exposure, combination of global equities as well as global cash, specifically invested in yen and sterling. Um, so contributors to returns in terms of specific stocks, uh, some of the recent additions on the global side actually contributed to returns. That includes Brookfield Asset Management. This is an investment company that invests in infrastructure assets and invests in renewable energy. And those kind of assets are very long term cash flows, which actually benefit from low interest rates. That actually raises the present value prepared to pay for those long term cash flows. And so that actually was sort of a positive for the share price of that new investment in the fund. It's not always that uh, the returns come through quickly, but obviously that, that is ideal. Um, another uh, investment idea that did benefit from those low interest rates on the sort of developed market side is the gold basket. The Global Flexible Fund does have um, a small allocation, a few percent to gold stocks such as Anglo Gold, uh, Ashanti, it's got Barrick Gold, it's also got Harmony Gold and gold prices were up during the third quarter as sort of the metal did uh, represent a bit of a safe haven with a bit of an uncertain you know geopolitical and global backdrop. So gold stocks benefit during the third quarter and the fund did benefit from that as well. Platinum producer Implats continued its extraordinary rally. It was up another 27% during the third quarter. Obviously, that is a stock that has given us many headaches over the time that we've held it, but it has generated very good returns for the fund from inception when we started introducing that stock. It is actually up uh, more than five times off uh, where it was about two years ago. And uh, that is on the back of rhodium and palladium prices actually being at incredibly high levels. If you look at platinum group metals as a whole, which includes platinum, rhodium and palladium, um, the prices are up more than 50% over the last two years in RAND terms. So that's really been finally at last a boost to the platinum producers such as Implats, uh, which has been the strongest beneficiary of that uptick. Uh, other strong contributors were a small cap such as Metrophile. I think this really highlights one of our advantages. We are a smaller asset manager. We are able to access parts of the market that the large value oriented managers cannot access by virtue of their size. Metrophile, you'll probably recognize as the record storage company. It's only 1 billion Rand market cap. Um, it has been under immense pressure along with many of these local businesses, uh, but somehow uh, that has attracted their attention of a, um, it seems, uh, an offshore company that is looking to acquire Metrophile. And of course, that saw the share price rallying quite considerably. In fact, it's up more than 70% from where it was in August. So I think if you look at what's happened locally in a market environment where the overall market is down more than 4%, you can have some of these 
um, investment opportunities because they were at extraordinarily low prices um, through acquisitions and activities such as that can have a huge uptick in value that happens very, very quickly. So we think you'll probably start to see more and more of that in that segment of the market because some of these companies are actually still pretty good businesses and they are just trading at incredibly low prices at single digit PEs and we have many of those in the fund but sized appropriately. So these are small positions but all together actually make up about half of the local equity exposure are small and mid cap stocks. So that's really allowing you to access a portion of the market which you would not be able to get exposure to through the larger asset managers. In terms of some of the detractors, uh, the domestic stocks did come under pressure. A company like Investment Holding Vehicle, Hoskin Consolidated Investments, did see its share price come down. This, we believe, is an extraordinary value opportunity. Um, this uh, vehicle holds as its main kind of asset uh, its exposure to Tsoho Sun. That actually makes up more than half of its net asset value. And if you actually just look at Tsoho Sun's share price and you just do the straight maths, um, its stake in Soho Sun, um, actually, if you look at the share price of HCI, it's actually trading at a discount even to just that portion of its NAV. So that's excluding its mining interests, excluding its transport interests, excluding its media interests, which you're getting for nothing. You are actually being paid effectively through a discount to actually take exposure to Soho Sun. And we believe that that Soho Sun is trading at a substantial discount itself because you can imagine that's gaming and leisure that's been under a lot of pressure. So we believe that that is an extraordinary opportunity. You've got an extraordinary uh, business which has demonstrated very good skills in terms of capital allocation over time at an incredible discount um, on any which measure that you do that calculation. Uh, but nonetheless, during the third quarter, that detracts slightly from returns. Domestic banks were also under pressure. We do have exposure to that uh, through first round, um, and that also did detract slightly. But overall, a neutral result for the quarter, which I think is not too bad, given the local backdrop especially. If you look at how the fund is positioned, I mentioned earlier that we have 60% exposure outside of South Africa. Um, we do have exposure to the yen and the sterling, as I mentioned, uh, within the sort of the global equity portion, we have high quality businesses trading at a discount to fair value. We do not have technology stocks there, so uh, we don't have to lie awake at night worrying that the very, very high prices that you're paying for these businesses is something akin to what we saw before the dot-com bubble burst. Um, you have a portfolio of investments which are completely uncorrelated to what happens in that segment of the market. They are undervalued, high quality businesses where we've taken advantage of some short term phenomenon to actually buy in at prices that make sense going forward. Uh, so we've tended to avoid having too much exposure to the US, although we do have some exposure to the US where there are value opportunities. And then we actually added to our exposure. So we added Nordstrom, which is the luxury retailer, where there's this perception that Amazon's going to obliterate all retailers. And we were able to buy this family owned business, uh, which has got incredible historic returns uh, over capital at a very, very low price. That makes sense in terms of stacking the odds in favor of good returns going forward. Overall, this fund has delivered very good returns since inception. We seek to achieve a return in excess of 6% above inflation per year. It has actually achieved that over its entire history. And we believe that we've put together a very robust portfolio that will weather um, many different market environments, protect capital in down markets, but unlock and create absolute returns for our investors over the long term.